Well, uh, we are in the middle of a series called The Good News for Relationships, and we are looking at one of the most famous passages of the New Testament. We're going to continue in our series next week, but this is going to be our last week with the hymn from Philippians chapter 2. And together we've been, we've been reading it together, and, I, and I'm going to ask you to do the same thing today. If you would stand with me, uh, we're going to read uh, only the, the hymn. We've been, re- we've been studying Philippians 2, 1 through 11. We're only going to read starting in verse 5. And so uh, let's all read it together. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can have a seat. A passage like that just is worth just sitting and thinking about and reflecting upon that the God who had existed from before time entered into time, broke into time, didn't just become a human, but became a servant. If there's anyone who should be exalted, it's this kind of human, this kind of God. Uh, we're going to, I have a, uh, I brought my whiteboard here, and uh, we're going to have one simple drawing that's going to help us think about and shape our teaching today. Uh, theologians have looked at this passage and said this metaphor is in some ways, might be the most helpful and profound metaphor of the Christian life. Uh, A guy I went to seminary with wrote a book about this, and uh, a guy named Paul Miller, and he just, he called it the J-curve. And if you can guess what the J-curve looks like, it looks like a J. And if you follow the passage you'll see that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But being God, he took the very nature of a servant and became a man, became obedient unto death. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place that, and he, he, in his name became the name that is above every other name. This is the path of Jesus' life, And this is the path of the Christian life. Uh, You you may have come to a point in your life where you were baptized. Uh, If you were baptized, you might remember you were buried in in his death and raised in his new life. Baptism is a symbol of the J-curve, where we unite ourselves not just with Jesus, but with his very life. And we see in the story of his life a pattern for our life. It's not just how we go into the Christian life, it's how we grow in the Christian life. Uh, This is the pattern, this is the metaphor. Uh, That being said, we live in a life that, we live in a world that resists, resists the J curve, resists this pattern. Uh, Paul, who wrote the book of Philippians, in his last letter to a mentee, in the very last chapter of the last letter, just gave his mentee a warning that I think uh, sounds true today as well. He said this, The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That sounds familiar, right? We live in a world, and I live in a, I live in a fleshly body that doesn't want the J-curve, that doesn't want the going down in order to go up. Everything in me and everything in our world prefers the shortcut. The shortcut that gets me from here to there without any suffering, without any difficulties. Uh, my, I, I don't know if you have one of these, but I have like my, my like personal junk email box. Like when I have to give somebody my email, I give them this email address and I'll check it from time to time, but it's just a whole bunch of junk that I can't even unscribe. I can't unsubscribe from these people fast enough. Right. But, uh, you know what the subject lines come out like, like Mark, you're not going to believe how much this is going to change your life or, uh, we lose 15 pounds in 15 minutes. Right. All right. Metabolism. Like when you are 15 now, I mean, all these promises, they, they put all these promises in the subject line just to get me to open up my email and maybe press that link, right? Uh, we live in a world that's always promising the shortcut. And we live in bodies that really prefer the shortcut. The problem is, is relationships don't work well with the shortcut. Relationships always have to obey the J curve. Uh, one of the dynamics uh, in, in my marriage, and I got permission to share this one, is that I have a, I, I have a, I have a brain that just kind of just moves way too fast for itself, right? And I'm, and I'm always moving really, really fast. And uh, my wife uses an economy of words, and she doesn't use words that are unnecessary. So she'll be in the middle of a sentence and thinking through the words that are, are appropriate to say, right? You know, this is a typical pattern of an introvert, but she's, she's saying the words that are necessary to say, and, and I just get tired of waiting, and so I just complete her sentence for her. And, and it's frustrating to her because I have a really bad batting average as to completing it in, in a way that actually, she's like, no, that's not what I was going to say. I wasn't going to say that at all. But like in my mind, I'm like, well, I thought this is what you're going to say. In my mind, you know, I just kind of skip, you know, like my mind just kind of runs, you know, I'll just run up, run back, run up, run back while she's finishing the sentence. So maybe she's going to say this, maybe she's going to say that. And she's like, no, that's not what I was going to say. I, in fact, this is, this, is, this is such an issue that I actually got her a gift just to just to let her know that I really wanted to change this. And so I got her this, this, this coaster that says, oh, I'm sorry, did the middle of my sentence interrupt the beginning of yours? Um, and because I, I just felt so bad that I was constantly interrupting it. What I want to do is I just want to take the shortcut. Because that will just be faster, more efficient, right? Relationships and trust aren't fast or efficient. Stephen Covey, uh, uh, or Stephen R. Covey, who wrote the book, uh, The Speed of Trust, says, when it comes to trust, fast is slow, but slow is fast. Relationships follow the J-curve. When I just simply listen and suffer, what ends up happening is I wait, and when I wait, I understand that intimacy forms. When I truly take the time to understand and resist what I want, I understand who that other person is, and they feel that understanding, and intimacy happens. When I resist my instincts to do it my way, oftentimes there's a vulnerability, me waiting, or me saying that hard thing that I didn't want to say. And in that death, a connection forms. And, there's, and when we come out of it with a stronger relationship, relationships follow the J curve. As I've gotten used to it, when I apologize and I say, I'm sorry, I wish I would have listened, there's an opportunity for her to forgive and we can become stronger and closer together. But listen to this, even if she doesn't forgive, 
In my apology, I become a stronger, wiser person. Why? Because I'm naming what I did wrong, and I'm saying I, I want to choose to not do that anymore. Regardless of whether she forgives me or not, I become a wiser, better person. Relationships follow the J curve. Uh, but in every aspect of our, our lives, we want to avoid it, right? Um, I'm feeling a sense of loss or grief. Let me find somebody else to blame instead of, instead of lamenting. I'm afraid of this thing, so I'm going to avoid it. Just keep myself busy doing something else rather than name it and choose courage. I've been working really, really hard. I've been really, really busy. Let me just play hard to recover rather than do what I need to do to truly rest. Let me, there's tension in our relationships. Let's make more memories rather than have the hard conversation. See how the shortcut keeps us from that which we really long for? If, uh, to humor me, I want more friends, so let me put together an amazing Instagram story so people will see how interesting I am rather than text somebody and ask them a thoughtful question about their life. The shortcut always promises an easier path, but the J-curve offers us what we really want. What I want to do today is I want to walk through this seeing how this played itself out in the person of Jesus and learn, if we can, what the J-curve might look like for the entirety of our Christian life, particularly our relationships, okay? Sound good? So we're going to start with this. The J-curve begins with the letting go of our entitlements. Look at Jesus. Being God... He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Uh, if, you go to, if you look at different Bibles, that end of that sentence will be translated differently. The older NIV will say uh, something to be grasped. Uh, they're struggling with it because the original Greek word is only used at this point in the Bible. The only time, that, the, only time the Bible uses this word in the original Greek um, is here. And if you go outside of it, it the word is uh, robbery. Uh, he didn't seem, he didn't consider equality with God something that he could rob for himself, that he could loot for himself. And that's why the NIV uses the term grasp. It's, it's, it's not something that he is choosing to leverage. Um, the, the passage says, who being in very nature God, it's not, it's because he's God, he is not going to use that authority to his own advantage. He releases his entitlement and he descends. Entitlement tells us this, that I deserve, I deserve better, I am better, this is beneath me. I deserve the shortcut. I, I insist on having things go my way. Suffering is, is, is not something that I should have to experience. Ironic, ironically, you'll see in this passage, Jesus continuing to descend. In the, in the middle of the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament times, Isaiah uh, made a prophecy about Satan, God's enemy. And this is, this is uh, how the prophecy went. Satan says, that, he says this about Satan. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, the utmost heights of Mount Zion. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Entitlement says, I will ascend. But the J-curve says, I can, I can descend. I can go down. Uh, but remember, our, our world drips with entitlement. You, you, you've seen the Burger King commercials, right? You can have your burger the, your, any way you want. Why? Because you rule. Like literally, they say, you rule. You, you get to ascend, right? 
the junk box, our junk email box continues to say, you shouldn't have to suffer. Everything should go easier for you. And uh, over time, we kind of listen to this. But there's a cycle to entitlement. Here's what happens to you um, when, when we give ourselves to it. We have too high expectations of what life should offer us, right? What happens when your expectations are too high? You're inevitably disappointed, right? And because you're entitled in your disappointment, you assume that it must be everybody else's fault. It must be God's fault, life's fault, whatever's fault, the Dems' fault, the Republicans, whoever, you find somebody else to blame. And when you do that, you isolate yourself more from people. And when you isolate yourself more from people, what ends up happening? You become more and more detached from reality. And therefore, you continue to have these high expectations. You continue to be disappointed. You continue to blame people. You continue to push yourself away from people. You'll lose track of reality. And then you continue to find yourself more isolated, more disappointed. Because that's not how you're made. That's not how life goes. That's not how life works. That's not the life that Jesus would offer you. The problem with letting go of entitlement is that we're afraid if I let go of what I think I deserve, what will happen? It almost feels like your wily coyote hanging on to that tree over the cliff and recognizing if, if I let go of what I think I deserve or what I think is what what is beholden to me, what this life should offer me, Will I, just, will I just be in a free-fall descent? And in some ways, maybe yes. But if you look at Jesus' path, the Son of God, the, the second person in the Trinity, he, he didn't have unreasonable expectations when this world broke, he accepted this world for what it is. Uh, man, and, man and woman were invited to co-rule this world with God. And man and woman broke from God and said they are going to do it their own way. And Jesus and the Godhead recognized that this world was in an in a utter rebellion against their creator. And this wasn't going to be tweaked Rules weren't going to fix this thing. Uh, the, there's going to be an utter rebellion and resistance. And it wasn't, and, and over the generations, they're going to more and more forget who he is and, can, and, and find resistance against who he is normal or even praiseworthy. Something very difficult needed to happen. They were going to lose track as to what, a true, what true humanity ought to be. And so over the course of 1,800 years, Abraham was chosen, Moses was called, and a nation was formed to begin to understand that, that, that following God is different than everything else out there. But still, they wouldn't get it. God had, would have to come in, in the form of a human to show us once again what true humanity is all about. God didn't just detach in his entitlement, but entered this world in the person of Jesus and descended and descended and descended and descended. To see Jesus' life is to see difficulty, but it's also to see a joyful person, a good person, a wonderful person. The, the life that all of us would long to live is the life that Jesus lived. And when we let go of entitlement, what we can do is that we're no longer grabbing for our own value. When we let go of our entitlement and the, the labels we want on our lives and the rewards we think we should get for our lives, then we, we have hands to open ourselves up to God for the value that he would give us, the rewards he would give us, the dignity and the mission that he would give us. Because it's not about us anymore. And when that happens, we receive his value, we, re we receive his mission, and we receive companionship on the servant's path. And that's the second point here. 
Jesus released himself from all the entitlements that the enemy would want him to take. He released all those things, and he took a different path called the servant's path. It said, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Think about, think about that, the God of this world. Made himself nothing. Took the very nature of a servant. Now, he didn't seem miserable. What we we'll read in the scriptures is a joyful person, but a joyful person living as a servant. You need to understand that this is unheard of in the ancient world or the modern world. This is something very, very different. And this might be very, very different than the Christianity that you were exposed to growing up. There's a lot of Christianity that's all about up and to the right. Man, it's all about if you name it and claim it, you believe God, he's going to get you up and to the right. If we rally together, we can retake this country. If we rally together, we can go up and to the right. There's a lot of Christianity that's all about winning. But that's not the Jesus path. Sorry, my uh, mic is making some noise on here. The Jesus path is a servant's path. We serve because he is, he becomes a servant, not because it was practical, but because he was God. If you look at the passage, it said, being God, he became a servant. It's the same, it's the same phrase in uh, verse 6, it says, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And, sent, and sent, same, same contract, and being found in his appearance as a man, he humbled himself by, become obedient, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He became a servant. Not because it was the practical, this is not like modern day servant leadership you find in leadership books. But because he was God, he just simply served. That was what's most glorious. In order to restore the relationship between God and humanity, he obeyed the rules of relationships, and he descended all the way down to the, to the very place where he pays for forgiveness. forgiveness. The way forgiveness works is that you pay it yourself. If, you're going to, if someone's going to forgive a debt, they're going to pay it for themselves. If somebody has wounded you, rather than exacting out of them the cost and the revenge that would come, you pay that yourself. That's why forgiveness, though it, its experience is free, is very, very costly. Now, uh, what I am saying to you is that at the heart and the, and the central aspect of the J-curve is submission and obedience. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and obeyed all the way to death. Now, do you cringe a little bit when you hear the word submission? Do you cringe a little bit? Let me have us look at it differently. Most of our achievements have an awful lot to do with submission. Most of your achievements in life was, had a, the pattern of submission. Some, some, most of us here have had, at some point in time had to o- obey the rules and do everything, everything expected of us to get a high school diploma. And, and we were rewarded with that diploma. Uh, many of us here have or are in the process of obeying the American Accreditation Society in, in fulfilling all the responsibilities to getting a college degree or another degree. We submit ourselves to those particular rules to get something better. You might have at one point in time submitted yourself to particular vows so that you can enter into a covenant of promise of marriage. Uh, for, so, for some of you, you submitted yourself to the experience of having a child in your home and became a parent. Uh, for some of you, you said no to uh, having uh, a certain amount of money now so that you can have more money in a retirement later. Uh, we submit ourselves to, to others all the time. The New Testament says, submit yourself to one another out of reverence of Christ. But our world continues to give us this message that we should be able to live lives 
free of submission. We should be able to make up our own rules. But think about what that would actually be like. If you were just free to submit yourself to your own feelings or your own interests or desires, did you, have you ever accomplished anything in life by just doing whatever you felt like? Uh, somewhere along the line, maybe your back started hurting and you, and you went to the chiropractor. You submitted to the chiropractor, right? Uh, uh, now, you might say this, well, I, I, I don't have, a, it, it's, it's not that. I just don't like one-way submission, like you're the boss and I, got to do, I have to do what you're telling. That just feels demeaning, right? Well, the chiropractor is a one-way thing. You don't like turn around, so your turn, you know, that doesn't happen, Right? Um, I'm, I'm going to a nutritionist now, and I'm trying to submit myself to doing whatever she tells me to do. I'm trying, right? But I'm not going to show up there the next time and say, well, what did you eat the last two weeks? It's not how it works. Uh, the things we achieve have an awful lot to do with our willingness to submit ourselves to the leadership of another. And what we see in Jesus is one who follows the leadership of of the Father. We're like, but let me we stay in this a little bit. But like, but what about those folks who use that to their own advantage and manipulate us in our submission? That's wrong. What I'm not saying is that we submit to bad people, but that just means we need to be opposed to bad people, not the concept of submission. We need to be opposed to bad leadership. We need to be opposed to bad people who use, use our leadership poorly. But submission in and of itself is a wonderful thing, and it gives us so much that we would never receive otherwise. If you're willing to do this, if you're willing to follow the J-curve, take the servant's path, see in Jesus one who doesn't serve because it's practical, but because he's just God. And, 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 and put yourself under the authority of relationships to other people, we're going to receive the inevitable redemption. And, and, that's, and that's the other aspect of the J-curve. There's always an inevitable redemption. We see Jesus submitted himself. He obeyed even to death. And what does God do? It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above Every name. All of Jesus' sufferings have, 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 have been redeemed and are being redeemed. As more and more follow him, as more and more people trust in him, as his life, begins the life becomes the life that gives life to every life, as, as people like you and me learn the J-curve, and learn to live not for our own selfish needs, but live and live in such a way that make the lives of other people better. Jesus' life continues to redeem itself throughout all the world. If there's anyone who should be exalted as the name above every other name, if there's anyone who, who should have every knee bow before them, would, should it not be the one who descended the most? If there's anyone who should ascend, shouldn't it not be the one who descended most? That's the Christian way of thinking. And it is counterculture to everything that we live around. And it's an entirely different way of being. It's not just how we go into the Christian life. It's how we grow into the Christian life. And this is not easy. Peter himself, Jesus is like, number one disciple. He struggled with this. He told Jesus, you need to take the shortcut. You should not suffer, Jesus. But later in his life, a mature Peter writing to other Christians who were suffering under bad political, oppressive political leadership and oppressive religious leadership and difficult financial situations. How did he help them think through it? He said this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. The struggle, though, is, if, if I can, is how wide is the curve? 
I don't mind going down, but if it can be like a shallow dip and like a really quick turn up, that, that, that would be much better. But there are some things in this life that we are going to carry to our death without seeing the ultimate meaning and the purpose and redemption around it. And Paul had this very experience himself. There are certain things that he never got a report from God as to why the suffering occurred. But this, is, this is, but this is what he wrote. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Uh, a pastor in our area, a guy named James Boyce, used to pastor at 10th Presbyterian, writing on this very passage, he says this, Jesus Christ became like us so that we might, may become like him. Jesus Christ became like us in our suffering so that we may become like him. Paul says in another place, he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. See, in many ways, humility is its own reward. Humility in and of itself is its own reward. It's, it's a reward to release yourself from the entitlement and the, and, the, and the awful entitlement cycle. It's a reward to learn to serve without needing to get something in advance. Or, or in return. It's a reward to be free of all the things that you expect this life to give you. Humility, to not have to constantly think about yourself and to take joy in all the wonderful aspects of this world and others is its own reward. Being stuck inside your own head, needing a shortcut on everything is a slavery. Entitlement is an, is, is an enslavement. But when you're free to not having to have life always go a certain way, you're free to be simply a servant. Think about, think about uh, your identity. If, if Jesus, didn't, Jesus came and described himself as a servant, he was also a teacher, he was also a Lord, he was also a prophet, he was also the king of kings. But if you but if you play, if he placed his identity as a king of kings, it would have been it would have been difficult for him to also then choose to be a servant. If if he if, if his identity was as a teacher, he would have to be a teacher, and then it would be difficult for him to serve. But when you're a servant, you can do whatever. Why? Because it's not about you. When you're a servant, you can step into every opportunity. Why? Because your primary identity is like I'm the preacher, man. I got this. All, it's all about me right here, right? Or I'm the boss of this place. I shouldn't have to be emptying the trash. Or, look, I provide for this family. Other people should be doing this stuff here like that, right? Really? All those are shortcuts. When you're a servant, you're free. Free to, free to be the person that God needs in that moment. Free to be the pe person that... Um, uh, that community needs in that moment, you're free to step in to whatever. Why? You're not bound. You're not bound to this entitlement. You're not bound to the shortcut. And we see that in Jesus. Jesus is still a servant. Jesus has been exalted as a servant, but he didn't leave his servant uh, mindset behind. He still serves. He still listens to your prayers. He waits upon you to pray. He is eager to respond to your prayers. He's eager to act upon whatever the church needs to thrive. Why? Because he lives to serve. There's this moment uh, we find in the, in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is teaching his folks how to not worry about uh, money and not how to worry about all these other things. But then he comes back with a warning. He, he says to them this. He says, you guys need to understand, you should be dressed ready for servant and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. This makes sense, right? These are some of the parables of Jesus. Like sometimes the master is going to come. Are we going to be the servants? Are we going to be the people choosing the right path in that moment? 
But then he gives the why, and the why comes out of nowhere, and, we, and I didn't see this coming when I was reading it. He says, because it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Because listen, truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, and will have them recline at the table, and he will come and wait on them. Jesus is still your servant. And that is why he is highly exalted. He continues to live the J curve. Because that's how life works. And that's how the Christian life works. And he invites us all into this. This is how we go into the Christian life through baptism, through uh, asking forgiveness and receiving his grace. And this is how we continue to grow in the Christian life and our relationships. Let's pray together.